Uh, I'm Phil Blackman, president of EAH, starting in July. We have one year of uh, duty. I'm really pleased that I was able to listen to Jim when he was giving a talk to the architect, the Adventurers Club of Honolulu. And uh, we're running a little short of time now, and I'm going to ask him to begin his show. And Jim, now I'm going to have you do your screen share and bring us to Mauna Kea. There it is. Okay. Uh, this, again, is sort of biblical, but anyway, let's uh, proceed. This is the business end of Mauna Kea, Mauna Kea Volcano, uh, the very top place. The actual summit of the volcano, the geological summit, is right here. I hope you can see my cursor. Probably can. So it is right there, that point there. And... Uh, uh, the uh, state doesn't want people messing with that because that is the official summit and it's got a marker. The Coast and Geodetic Survey landed around a three or four inch diameter brass plaque right there that says, uh, mo uh, let's see, it's uh, the uh, summit of Mauna Kea at 13,796 feet. And they put these markers in a lot of places geologically significant. Anyway, okay, so that's the very peak. But we don't want to use that as an observatory place because that's the main summit, that's geologic significance. And there are a number of things on the summit area of the mountain that we don't mess with. That's just one, Lake Wyal is another, and uh, there may be a couple of others. But anyway, uh, I want to uh, dwell a little on this because uh, this is all significant in that Right now, there are no developments up here. This is all barren, plain uh, cinder cones from past eruptions on Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is about uh, a million years old. It uh, has uh, uh, it uh, started down in a deep ocean. It was about uh, 15,700 feet deep is where it started, that's where its base is. And so considering the uh, almost 14,000 feet of extent, vertical extent, this assembly, which is a mountain from, from its base at, down at the uh, water, uh, at the origin at the water level, uh, that's uh, almost 20,000 feet. So anyway, uh, uh, let's, uh, Talk just a little bit more about this. You see, there's a, a, it's actually a dirt road here. When I say road, dirt road, when we usually drive on dirt roads in the boonies, uh, they have road signs like a speed limit sign and how many miles you are from somewhere. This, none of this, there's no infrastructure on this at all. A bulldozer went back and forth on this and created the road that gives us access. I'm standing, when I took this photo, this was in 1965, I was standing on uh, the uh, bank of Pu'upo'yahu, a cinder cone to the west of this main complex. As you see, it's, it's a complex of cinder cones. They all were spouting off around here. Okay, now, um, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to uh, say about this? Uh, not now, we will see uh, as we developed in here, we wanted to get up to the, this top place here, so we actually, we being the uh, University of Hawaii, got a uh, switchback road put up along the, the uh, slope over here and uh, across here, and we had measurement sites around here. So anyway, let me now continue with the main part of the show. And for, for a little, I want to talk about myself for uh, three or four slides here to show you my background, how I managed to get to be uh, supervisor for a, uh, a major uh, uh, science project up here. Anyway, uh, we'll continue on. And I graduated from Columbia University, uh, class of 1958, uh, with a physics major. And so here's my graduation day. This was the hardest thing I ever did in my life was to get a physics degree from Columbia. But it sure had, did make my life pleasant uh, for the rest of it. 
So what am I going to do now? Uh, the problem was while I was going to college, I was deferred from the military. Uh, for everybody from 18 years old to 25, they had to serve in the military unless they had a good reason not to. And my reason was I was going to uh, Columbia College. Well, Columbia College is the undergraduate part of Columbia University. Anyway, uh, so uh, at this point, I'm going to lose my deferment. And I did have to go in to have my uh, physical. They want to make sure you're physically fit to, uh, to serve in the military. I got my physical. I passed it. So I was told I had about three weeks to get uh, to do something about it or I was going to be called up. So I looked in a, for an ad in the paper and there was a little company in Connecticut, about 40 minutes by train away from New York City. And uh, that company had a contract with the Advanced Research uh, Project Agency of the Defense Department, ARPA. And the project was on the Atlantic Missile Range measuring on a uh, uh, research ship uh, using all kinds of uh, optical and infrared uh, tracking and recording equipment, the re-entries of ballistic missiles that were shot off from Cape Canaveral as they come screaming into the atmosphere uh, close to Ascension Island in the South Atlantic. So uh, this was the ship that I worked on for five years, the American Mariner. And back here, it was all here where the action was. There are four slave pedestals back here that can carry optical and infrared equipment. And they had radars here that were operated by RCA. I didn't have anything to do with those. This is what it looked like on the back of this research ship. And uh, this, this was ours, a, uh, an optical tracker, an automatic, it used the automatic infrared. When missiles come into the atmosphere, they glow like crazy. It's like 4th of July all over again. So uh, there's plenty of energy to uh, lock onto. And these are slave pedestals, which you can't see very well here but they carry uh, optical research equipment. And these are the big uh, RCA radars that also are following the missile when it comes in. So this is a close up now. We've got two radiometers here mounted, a boresight camera. This just uh, records on 16 millimeter film, whatever this machine is looking at. It has two axes, an axis here, and then a vertical axis. Of course, the ship is moving around, so this is, but we can lock onto the target with the uh, radar, and that will cancel out the ship's motion. This is a uh, cine spectrograph, 70 millimeter cine spectrograph with an objective grading. So we're almost out of here. Of course, I've got to show a picture of me here in 1965 or 66 with a high speed uh, sequence camera, uh, 200 frames a second of 70 millimeter film. And I'm doing something here to get my picture taken uh, while uh, the, the uh, uh, slave pedestal is locked in position. Okay, now let's get back to the real thing here. I, I spent five years on that tracking ship. Oh, I didn't mention in 1962, we were called over to the Pacific, to Johnston Island, where they were uh, setting off atomic explosions with rockets, they would send a rocket way up in the uh, high atmosphere or out into space and detonate a uh, atomic bomb. And they wanted us to cover it with all of our equipment. So we worked out of Honolulu in 1962 and that's where I discovered Hawaii. So when the uh, tracking ship job ended, I came out for like a sabbatical to uh, Maui where my mother and sister had moved and uh, then uh, I saw an article in the paper. Actually, we had moved, by this time, we had moved over to uh, Honolulu, where my sister went to the, uh, uh, the University of Hawaii. And the, the ad in the paper said they needed somebody to go to Mauna Kea and utilize uh, uh, optical equipment to find, and weather equipment, to find the best position for a NASA telescope that was going to go in. So I applied for that position, and with this background of a Columbia degree and uh, a, a research ship, five years of a research ship using sophisticated instrumentation, I got the job. So anyway, these are the topics we're going to cover here. I'll try to get through them as fast as I can, but I'm, I'm not going to short circuit anything for you guys. 
Okay, uh, we'll uh, see the summit layout. Uh, and uh, then Haipohaku is a sort of a settlement at uh, 9,000 feet on uh, the south slope of Mauna Kea that was put in in the 1930s in the depression by the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps. Some stone buildings, and it's not really a settlement, it's, it was for hunters. Uh, it was a cabin for uh, hunters. Anyway, that's, you'll see Halipahaku. You'll see some of the weather equipment we use. Uh, the weather was, uh, the microclimate there was just as important as the optical uh, clarity of the atmosphere. And then uh, some of the instrumentation and data we, uh, we use, instrumentation we use and the data it produced. And then uh, some scenes of us building the observing stations that we, we set up. And then I've got some of Lake Waiau, the lake I mentioned earlier, that now is offline. They've got rocks in where the road was to it because we don't want anybody messing with Lake Waiau. Uh, and uh, then uh, just a few slides of our life on the mountain. And then an epilogue, which shows uh, how the mountain developed over the years. Just a very few slides of that. So let's go forward. And here we see a uh, Google uh, satellite photo, I guess it was, of the summit area of Mauna Kea. Now you didn't know that Google was operating back in 1965, I bet, and it actually wasn't. You see development here. These are the twin Keck telescopes. And uh, anyway, what we want to see here is the layout. Uh, how, where do I start? This is the road that we had at the time that goes up here. And there's a road, a Google road, uh, Google Maps uh, demarcation of a road here that's all very white and uh, it looks official. Well, just ignore that because as you see, it's displaced from the real road here, the gray. That's the uh, cinders, uh, that's the color of the cinders that used to uh, coat the road. And uh, I might mention that in uh, March of 1966, if I've got this in a nice display here, uh, a colleague and I staked out this switchback road, which goes here. Now we wanted it to go, this is a shelf here, we wanted it to go to the shelf and then back up here, and then it connects with the, the level ridge of this cinder cone. It was all the way around there, and that's all level. So uh, we wanted to tie into that. So I hiked up through here, all the way along here, with a, a bundle of four foot long stakes tied to my back, and a roll of red ribbons. And I would walk about 100 feet, Along, this was not a road then, this is just along the, the surface of the uh, cinder cone, and, and pound in a stake and tie a red ribbon to it another 100 feet. And my colleague behind me would fill in a, in between those stakes with a stake of his own. So we had stakes about every 50 feet going all the way along this path here. And only we, we staked, it, staked it out to this uh, shelf where we staked in the, the, uh, uh, the gooseneck here. And then we staked, uh, staked out the path. We kept a very gentle slope because this is at almost 14,000 feet and cars didn't run too well up here. So we had a very gentle slope that eventually tied in to the uh, level uh, ridge of this cinder cone. So we will see a number of signs of this, uh, uh, this switch back because that, that, that gives us everything. Uh, for up in here. And this is what we call Pu'u Goodrich. It has a Hawaiian name that we didn't know it at the time, and I don't know it now, but it's like you could draw this cinder cone with a compass. It must have erupted when no winds were blowing at all, because all the other cinder cones are shaped uh, like uh, an ellipse. This is Pu'u Poliahu, and it had a little observatory put up here by the University of Arizona in 1964 before we started with this uh, site evaluation. And uh, the University of Arizona wanted to put a 60 inch telescope up here somewhere, but uh, the University of Hawaii beat them out and we got NASA to fund an 84 inch telescope, not up here, but over here. 
But anyway, they had a 12 and a half inch telescope in this dome and uh, it's no longer here, but it was then. It was the first item uh, of any development on this mountain. And the road, uh, the old road, like I say, is blocked off now, goes up here and around and to that point. I was pointing here, it might have been to this point here that that was. And this is one of the oldest cinder cones on the mountain, and it has uh, detritus on it from the uh, uh, ice uh, glacier that uh, developed during the Pleistocene age up here. And uh, so anyway, this is just a geologic uh, thing here because it's uh, the uh, oldest cinder cone on the mountain that geologists have determined it. Okay, now let's continue. I'm not going to spend this much time on every one of these, but uh, I do want to show uh, five. Okay, now uh, you see this is shortly after we built the uh, switchback, and you can see it. Unfortunately, you can see it all over the island, the south part of the island. And uh, my boss, John Jeffries, got uh, chewed out by the uh, State Department of Land and Natural Resources because People were complaining about it, they could see it. it. It wasn't a pristine original cinder cone now, it was this developed piece. And, they, and uh, my boss never went to uh, the Department of Land and Natural Resources for permission to do this. So uh, the penalty he had to pay was to pay for a, uh, a contractor to coat the road here with cinders of the same color as the body of the cinder cone. But of course, you can't see the, that, that which is on the roadway. All you can see is the cut that was made, the vertical cut. And that's a different color. So that didn't do much good. But anyway, that's the history of that. But this is what we drive up to. This is the way the dirt road goes to get up to this area around the top of the mountain. And this is Pu'u Poliahu again that I took at the, at the time when they had the 12-inch observatory up there. I might say that uh, we had about uh, three weeks, three or four weeks of the individual's uh, expertise that put this little observatory up here. And his expertise was in optics. And he had his own personal 12 and a half inch telescope he put in this dome that the University of Arizona built for it. And I had a chance to look through his telescope up here one night, and we looked at Jupiter. And this was in nine, the 1960s, and nobody had been close to Jupiter. It was just uh, Earth-bound telescopes. Nobody knew that the uh, bands on the face of Jupiter had uh, some uh, chaotic whirls uh, between the bands. And I could see these chaotic whirls, and I, I remarked, I said, look, look here, it said Jupiter has these whirls between the bands. And he said, yeah, yeah, they're there. They're there, all right. But nobody discovered them until they got a um, satellite of Jupiter to go up and uh, spin past it and take all those good pictures in the late 70s. Then we could see the whirls between the bands on Jupiter that I saw here in 1965 or 66. Anyway, OK, that's it. Now let's continue. OK, now here is a service uh, here's a diagram of the service road from the 28 mile marker the saddle road comes up here and it uh, uh it takes off here and goes up in those days it this paved now but in those days it was uh, just a dirt road and it winds up here past the humaula sheep station which is a parker ranch facility with uh some buildings and we drive through uh various pastures and then uh, we uh, get up to 9,000 feet, just a little above 9,200 9, feet, and we're at Hale Pohaku. You will see pictures of this now. Hale Pohaku is a mid-level place where we would sleep and eat uh, and rest between runs. We were on duty two people at a time at least. Nobody, one, one person was not allowed ever to go up above Hale Pohaku. Up, up to the uh, wilderness up in here. So we always were true. If one person got sick or something, nobody would go up. But anyway, uh, 
the uh, two of us would, uh, sometimes there's three of us, would uh, sleep and eat here at Holly Pohaku, and you will see pictures of those facilities. But anyway, following the road, it now does these switchbacks and things and gets up in here where uh, the, the main summit cinder cones are. And uh, Lake Waiau is here and Pu'upoliahu is here. And that's Pu'u Goodrich, the circular cinder cone. Okay. And let's focus in on it. Uh, the blue line is the old road that was taken out when uh, they started building the uh, telescope. And there was a lot of uh, construction traffic. So this was blocked off. And the road was on the other side of Pu'u Goodrich. You take us as far away from Lake Waiau as we could. And then it did these switchbacks. And now we are on the summit road opposite the geologic summit, which is here. And now I will show you, if this is set up right, show you where our measurement sites were in this kind of a diagram. And here they are. Yes, it is set up right. Okay, now this is the diagram for three sanding sites we had. We just had portable equipment. And then we built walled enclosures at these sites. These three sites were, were for the entire year and a half we made measurements. So we made uh, measurements on the south side here at 12,700 feet. Uh, we made measurements for uh, two or three weeks at Lake Waiau just to see what a body of water would do to the measurements we were making for the weather and for the atmospheric conditions and for the uh, observational conditions. Uh, uh, what that body of water would do to that. So then we took measurements on the 13,000 foot contour, well, close to the 13,000 foot contour. And uh, some measurements up there where that observatory was, because that, that observatory was left there for our use. And, but we didn't use uh, my colleague's uh, 12 and a half inch telescope, we used our own observing equipment, which you will see pictures of. Now, uh, Oh, and then we would we went up here and uh, uh, had a walled enclosure on the summit uh, cinder cone uh, uh, level uh, area here, and then the geologic summit is across the cinder cone right there. Now, what am I saying? Thirteen north here. Notice that all of these observing sites are on the south side of the mountain and close to these. Uh, structures, the uh, not structures exactly, these uh, formations of cinder cones. Now, the, the winds usually come in from the north and the northeast, and they get in with all these cinder cones and they're turbulent. And turbulence is bad for observation. But all we're measuring here is uh, turbulent areas because we want to stay close to the road. We're not going to go hiking way off across terrain to get to our observing sites. And there was no road going out here. Well, I hiked out through, through here. This is a mile here, so it's about a mile away from, I think we could get up to about right here on the roads that was uh, on an old dirt, dirt road. And then I had a hike out to here, but I hiked out to the 13,000 foot point. I carried an a, a altimeter with me. And I also carried a, a bubble level sextant because for every, all the stars we observed, we had to, uh, say what their uh, uh, their uh, level was above the horizon, the, uh, the the height of the uh, star above the horizon for every star we measured, because that's what telescopes see. Is uh, they they uh, uh, they know about uh, vertical and horizontal. Anyway, so what I did, I hiked out to this site here. And I saw that this was great because the terrain was heavy duty lava, congealed lava, which should be fine to construct on. It wasn't cinders. I thought that cinders would be uh, vetoed because they're, they're soft and uh, they, they can move around. Anyway, uh, so there was that. And so and we're at 13,000 feet, which is twice the, the, the height of, of almost every uh, observatory in the world at that time. So this is at plenty of elevation. And 
astronomers love to be able to see the southern horizon because if they, from their telescope here in uh, Hawaii, if, if they can see an object that they want to study that comes up above the horizon in the yearly uh, progression of the astronomical positions, if, it, if a, uh, this object comes up above the horizon for like two or three hours in a day for like a month and a half, they can do their research. But if there's something in the way of the horizon, they can't, they'll have to go to Chile. So, so it was important for the observa an observatory that was put in here to be able to see the, uh, just above the southern horizon. So my bubble level told me that, this, that the peak of this cinder cone was uh, 10 degrees above the horizon, which is great because the mechanical construction of a uh, telescope, most telescopes, you can't bring it closer than about 15, uh, 10 to 15 degrees of the, uh, of the horizon because of just the mechanics of the construction of the telescope and the dome. So this, isn't, this wasn't going to be a problem. And yet this was going to be in, in fresh, clear air that's just blowing uniformly, no turbulence. And it's got plenty of uh, solid lava to build on. This is great. So we made a permanent site here, and had, when we had the road put through on top here, we had this road put through out to 13 North. So uh, anyway, now, just for, to finalize what we're talking about here, 13 North is the exact site that the 30 meter telescope pit, picked to build the TMT, the 30, mil, 30 meter telescope largest in the world, that, the, uh, will, that will be uh, built on Mauna Kea. It will be built at my site 13 North. So I want a plaque on that telescope when it's built and it will say here, Jim Harwood had the site survey operational uh, enclosure for study of the, uh, of the stars and the weather for in placement of a telescope. 1965 or 66 actually but that will never happen i'm sure oh yeah i want this uh switchback to be named jim harwood switchback that's not going to happen either because <laughs> that's been in there for what 50 years nobody's thought to name it after me maybe if i have this uh presentation a little more often some of these things will come to pass who knows Okay, well, I'm holding you up. Let's go. Okay, now let's start looking at some of the equipment we've got. First, uh, let's step back a little bit. Uh, this is where I lived in Hilo when I was uh, working on this uh, project for a year and a half. Uh, this is in the Pionua area in Upper Hilo where it rains 300 inches a year. And so everybody that in that neighborhood, uh, well, that, that part of Hilo uses uh, this uh, galvanized uh, metal roof construction. It's the only thing that holds up. Now, this uh, you couldn't really walk around on this grass because it was sopping wet. All night long it rains. The rain just pours down and pounds on the uh, metal roof. But at the daytime, you wake up and the sun is shining. Then at thir 3 o'clock in the afternoon, this day after day after day, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the clouds come in, cover it up. At 5 o'clock in the morning, I mean in the afternoon, it's starting to rain, and all night long it rains. And day after day, this is what it is, 300 inches a year of rain. Anyway, let's get going. This is inside this house that I rented. Incidentally, I might mention this is a three bedroom, two bath house. And the other bedrooms were used by uh, some of our, my colleagues who uh, uh, paid part of the rent. But uh, I had my tape recorder up here for classical music. I studied violin for uh, nine years from age 10 to 19. and. Uh, I developed a love of classical music. I still do, but I like all kinds of other music too. In the 1960s, this was a saddle road. It's been improved since then. Now they call it Daniel K. Inouye uh, Saddle Road, I guess. Uh, they, they want to name everything after him. I, they might as well. He's, he was a great uh, person of, of our culture. So anyway, what happens here is this is not big enough for a, uh, for a, um, a car and we used uh, bigger cars to, with the four-wheel drive uh, uh, SUVs, they call them nowadays. Anyway, what you would have to do is a car is coming at you, 
you have to get these wheels off on this side thing here, which is very uh, rough and banging. And, and people, our people have gotten uh, flats on doing this. And the guy on this side has to do the same thing. Meanwhile, you drive just using the whole uh, road, drive, and there's, uh, it goes around and around. This goes all the way to the Pohaku Loa training area beyond the 28-mile uh, cutoff to uh, Mauna Kea. So, okay, so now we're going up here. We're on our way to Mauna Kea. And this is the lava flow from uh, Mauna Loa of 1935. And uh, I can claim this lava flow because I was born in 1935. So as I'm driving along here, I can kind of uh, meld my uh, psyche with the psyche of this lava flow. And uh, way up here be to the left is uh, where we take off on the road going up to the summit. Of course, we can see the summit area up here. And now we are heading up the dirt, the, the really bad dirt road that goes between Hale Pohaku and the saddle road which runs down here along the 1935 flow, my 1935 flow. And uh, now we're up above Holly Pohaka, which we'll get down to in a minute. And this is later, this is 1970s. I, I wanted to throw this in to show you what it looks like with a better picture than the previous one, where uh, the uh, saddle road goes along here. And then this road goes past the Humu'u sheep station, comes up through here. And then this is Holly Pohaku. Our, uh, even nowadays, this is like a hotel here. And people that are uh, not going to be uh, working all night at the observatory stay over here during their observing run. OK, now also I might mention we had a chain gate here. that You can't see it now because they've taken it out. But there's two poles on both sides of the road right down here. And a very heavy chain was uh, a padlock between those. And we had keys we got from the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Uh, they gave us keys to use. But anyway, so, so up above here, the, uh, it was almost unused because uh, the people were locked out by that chain gate, except for us. Okay, now we'll see uh, Holly Pohaku. It says Mauna Kea State Park, Holly Pohaku area there. And these buildings were built in the 1930s, as I said, by the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. And uh, for a while there, we took on one of these, I think it was this one, one of these uh, buildings kind of semi-permanently because uh, we didn't have any place else to go. And this is the restroom here and uh, water tank here. So uh, I was curious as to what was floating on the top of this water tank, if anything. So I got a ladder and got up here and looked under there and there was a dead bird floating on top of this. But none of us were sick, and then we didn't get, I just left it be. None, none of us were sick, and uh, uh, so the water was, was good water. Apparently, the germs were all diluted in there because they didn't bother us. And now we'll see inside the building, and here we are. This is one of my colleagues here, a very important colleague. I'll tell you why in a minute. Frank Che is his name. He's the only one of, of all of us. There are about six, five to seven people in my crew, including me. And he was the only one that was born in Hawaii. He went to the uh, uh, University of Hawaii, and he got his bachelor's degree in art. Now, now we could draw pictures. He could draw pictures and watercolors of all of our installations. No, I'm just joking. Why would we hire somebody that has a degree in art for a very, as you will see later on, a very technical operation? Because this gentleman got drafted right after college, and they put him in a, a school to learn meteorology. So he's a meteorological technician, an expert on uh, the uh, instruments used in, in making weather measurements. So, and he also could tell us all about things like the clouds. We learned how to identify clouds uh, and other aspects of, uh, of the uh, sky that we didn't know before. Now, I can't explain why I've got this uh, uh, female uh, apron here. Either it was left here by another uh, occupant, or I'm trying to do a joke and, and, and wear a female apron around when I'm cooking dinner. We didn't really use this wood stove for anything but heating the room. We had these bunk beds. Uh, we cooked our meals on this uh, much more easy to use, this uh, propane stove. Oh, and then I, the, the, this uh, uh, is one of our most excellent uh, instruments 
uh, optical instruments, so ast astronomical instruments. It's a uh, its brand name is Quistar, and it is a professional uh, three and a half inch telescope. Very very useful uh, uh, bearings and uh, axes, and uh, it was easy to use. It, it had a, a, a quarter twenty uh, screw in it, and uh, we could just uh, fasten it on with a uh, uh, with a wing nut on a uh, mount. But I'll show you it later. Anyway. Uh, our, my boss, John Jeffries, came to visit us here, and he was shocked because it's kind of messy, and it's, it's like a partial prison, and uh, he thought that this was not for the likes of us to stay in. So he got us other accommodations. This is still Holly Pohaku now, and this was the most amazing, this is in the early 70s, sunset I ever saw around Holly Pohaku. It was just absolutely spectacular. Uh, so I, I'll show you two, two sides of it at different levels. It was like uh, uh, the world was going to change into something else. It was just spectacular. And uh, this is a newer building. See, this was built in the 70s after the 80-inch uh, uh, telescope uh, got uh, put in operation. OK. Now, this is. Uh, Dr. Jeffries got us this uh, house trailer, which was declared surplus from a South Point tracking station on the Big Island that was being disbanded. So we got this and another vehicle, a, uh, a large van, which you will see more of later. But anyway, this uh, was very useful to us. And this is alongside a cabin. It looks like it's coming out of the cabin as some kind of perspective distortion. I don't exactly know how this works. I wish I could show you a better picture of it. It shows this. It is actual space between it and the wall of this cabin. This cabin had four bunk beds and was convenient for people to stay in uh, during the site survey. So anyway, uh, I used the bedroom in here and uh, in this trailer and it had a kitchen and, uh, and a nice couch here, it was a nice uh, place. We didn't have electricity. There's not, no electricity for anything that I'm showing you. So, uh, but we, we could use uh, propane gas. And, and that's what I'm gonna show you here. This is a propane gas light with a, um, a mantle, we call it, M-A-N-T-E-L, or T-L-E, M-A-N-T-L-E. Now I'm excused, anyway, you take a match and you light them, you turn on the gas, it goes hiss, you uh, light the match, and the mantle picks up the incandescent gas, and th that then becomes as bit bright as a 100 watt light bulb. And it lasts for, well, you see our big tanks here, are propane. So this will last for a week. And we've got these in every uh, of, the, of the rooms of the cabin and of uh, the other uh, vehicle that we got. Anyway, uh, I'm sitting here looking very pleased because I'm on duty here by myself. My uh, colleague for, for the previous night uh, went down to Hilo directly from getting off the mountain. He didn't stay here to sleep or anything. That's what uh, we would do. We would just head straight. Uh, we all had enough vehicles so where we could just head straight down to Hilo and then go to bed down there and sleep. Meanwhile, my uh, replacement colleague isn't going to get up here till about seven. He's going to have dinner in Hilo and then drive up here. So I just made dinner for myself. And this is my 30th birthday. It was a decade birthday. So, and I've already got a neat job. I'm uh, having fun in, the, uh, in this strange environment. And I made myself a batch of brownies with a little candle on it. So let's, let's see that. See this? Well, this was terrible. This, this, is, uh, uh, this must have been like a new state of matter that I had invented without knowing it. Because this candle wouldn't just sink into the brownies. Oh no, I had to get a hammer and screwdriver and pound with repeated blows of the hammer enough uh, to make a puka here for this to go in. This is totally inedible. It, it, you couldn't even cut into it. it it's amazing. I was so disappointed. So uh, I'll back up one, back to this again. And so what I did was, oh yes, I took this picture by setting my, because I was alone up there. 
I set my Nikon camera on the uh, kitchen counter and pointed it here. And I had a feature on that camera where I could uh, set the feature. And then when I press the, uh, the shutter release, it would count down five seconds or 10 seconds, give me a chance to get over here and sit down and smile like I'm happy. And then it goes click and it took this picture. So, uh, but as I say, I was really disappointed. So what I did was I took this, after taking this picture, I, I took, blew out the candle, took it out, took this uh, set of in edible brownies, went out the door, the door is off to the uh, far right, stepped out and threw this pan and all, uh, brownies and pan, as far into the bushes as I could. And I didn't care what happened to it. It probably got uh, attempted to eat by uh, uh, the uh, some of the... Uh, the pigs that were running around, the uh, the boars, the wild boars, because for a long time afterward, they'd see these boars with, with broken tusks. And I'm sure that was because they were trying to eat this uh, granite-like stuff. Anyway, let's keep going. Okay, now let's go to uh, weather equipment. So this is what we get. This is a standard weather box that the uh, Weather Bureau, it was called the Weather Bureau in those days. Now it's uh, called a much more sophisticated name, the U.S. US weather Bureau. And it's got the instrumentation and it's protected from the weather by uh, this, this door that shuts. Anyway, these are a uh, wet bulb and dry bulb thermometers that we use to get the uh, relative humidity. We give the wet bulb, we, we wet the wick on the end of it and then give it a spin. And this cools down more than this one because the, uh, uh, of the wick. And if there's a lot of, of moisture in the air, the wick won't evaporate very much off, and so this temperature will be close to this temperature. But if it's like it usually is on Mauna Kea, even a Holly Pohaku, extremely dry, then all this water will on the wick will evaporate almost instantaneously, and the temperature will plummet. And then the difference in temperatures then show that there's very little humidity. But we also had a, a uh, chart recorder here for temperature and humidity itself. Uh, it uh, records seven days continuously on a uh, chart record. And uh, then once a week, we have to take the, the used chart record off and we, sp uh, we uh, affix to it a new one and set it up and turn it on. It's a wind up that uh, will run for a week on one winding. Now, this is how we uh, make measurements when the wind is blowing hard and it's freezing cold outside. It uh, gets uh, below freezing usually every, every night. And if the wind is blowing, there's that wind chill factor too. Also, uh, what we uh, have to make notes on to fill out uh, uh, chart records or uh, diagram, or let's see, what do we call it? Uh, uh, we have to fill out uh, data sheets, that's it. Uh, on a clipboard. And with the wind blowing, we can't do that so well, but this uh, uh, particular four-wheel drive vehicle had this nice little window that, lit, that went up, and we could fill out the, uh, uh, the data sheet uh, in relative comfort of the back of this, uh, this truck. So anyway, this is the kind of thing we had to put up with. But as you see, we're really uh, bundled up. Uh, this is an example of the sheet we fill out. I won't go over this. Uh, just uh, just to point out that uh, what is it? it's uh, run the different runs uh, uh, the summit side 13 north side and then there's a, a, a oh the night in one night then we do uh, took all of these measurements but this is an anemometer we use too it's a, a German anemometer and it's a strange one because uh, number one it's about 30 days on one wind up for the chart here, the chart recorder paper, a spool. So uh, anyway, uh, we make notes because uh, since it runs on one spool for 30 days, you can easily get lost unless you uh, for every night and, and, and which run we're on to make notes on this. And I'm gonna mention a, a strange thing about this anemometer was that uh, the, uh, we do not measure wind speed directly. We measure the uh, amount of distance that the wind moved in a unit of time past the anemometer. 
And of course, if the anemometers are going real fast, that means uh, the wind moved a long way past it in one uh, instant of time. But we had to reduce the data from uh, wind displacement to wind speed manually. And I'll show you how that was done. This is an example of that uh, 30 days with one winding the uh, German anemometer. And what it is, is if there, if there is no uh, air moving at all, if it's stationary and the, uh, the cups or uh, rotational cups are fixed, uh, they it would just make a mark along the vertical like this. But uh, since there's an actual wind speed and the, and the uh, uh, cups are counting distance that the wind traveled, that is shown by these diagonal lines. And we have to measure the angle here to get the slope of the line, which gives us the wind velocity. So there's a little computation to do there. Well, I got a, a student help from the uh, Hilo College to uh, come in if it spent hours on these chart recordings reducing this data. This was on July 26, the night of July 26, 1966 at uh, 20 hours, which is 8 p.m. 40, so this is our first run. And uh, this is the direction of the wind, and this is just direct, northeast, south, and west. So the wind was running uh, kind of uh, uh, slowly com compared to what it usually does. But anyway, uh, let's go on. Okay, now this is the summit, uh, uh, area, like I was saying, it's a flat uh, top of the summit cinder cone. And uh, uh, we've it's been bulldozed to, to a little bit more flat here. And this is one part of the instrument uh, shelter that uh, we built. And this is a uh, wind, I mean, a, a rain gate. This is a rain gate. There is a uh, a uh, weather box associated with this, but a little bit farther away from it. We don't want to measure the weather. Of this. Okay, now let's go. We're moving along here. Instrumentation data. Okay, now I need to tell you some of this. Uh, I'm tempted to give you guys a, uh, a, a test after this, but uh, I will count on you to memorize this. Uh, one of the things that was very important to us was how much turbulence there was in the image of a star. And the turbulence is caused mainly by atmospherics. And so uh, we, we tell how clear the atmosphere was by looking at this airy disk diffraction pattern. It turns out that when you look at a very, very small bright object that's at infinity, it doesn't just, uh, and you magnify it where, at the focal point where you're, when you're looking at it, the image doesn't stay as a small, microscopically small image. Because of uh, the physics of uh, optics and how light rays behave and interfere with each other, you get what they call a diffraction pattern, where you get uh, sort of an image of the center of the, well, a, 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 what looks like an image of the uh, of the point source, but it's not really an image of it. It's just that the, the light from the point source gets to be focused right here. And then the light conflicts, uh, interferes with itself, and you, it, there's no light here. Uh, let's go back. There's no light here where in, this, in the dark brown. And then the, the light beams reinforce each other, and it makes a fairly bright ring here, but dimmer than the, in the middle, and so on out here with a number of rings. And if you see this, it's absolutely perfect optics, and you, you've got an absolutely perfect point source, and it's perfect optics, and you get this diffraction pattern, which tells you that uh, the atmosphere is doing no turbulence at all. Now, we never see it look like this unless we're out in space. Uh, now, the Danjon scale is for atmospheric turbulence, and there's, uh, it was used to, to uh, quantize uh, atmospheric turbulence uh, by uh, giving numbers to the images as they are more and more uh, distorted from uh, turbulence. So uh, a, a five, if we read a five, it looks almost like this, just a little bit broken up, almost like that is a five. A four is almost complete rings around it, but not quite. And a three is, well, we've got quite a lot of uh, disturbance of the image here. 
Look, look at the, the center now is not even a circle anymore. Uh, number two is it's just really bad. It's breaking all off. Number three is you can't see a, the, any uh, airy disk diffraction pattern there at all. It's just a big blob. So this is what we would assign every time we would look at a star through the telescope that we use that Questar telescope. We, under high magnification, we wanted to get an airy disk. And most of the time, it was five and four. That's such good atmospherics up on top of the summit. For one thing, the summit is... Uh, uh, 40% less air than a sea level, and which means 40% less oxygen. So I'm not going to talk about the various uh, uh, trials and tribulations we had because of uh, oxygen deprivation, but uh, it wasn't that bad. This is the uh, instrument I was talking about that under high magnification gives us an airy disk pattern. This is one of our staff using it. I built this, uh, uh, this frame. The frame when leveled and oriented to the north, allows the, the uh, a telescope here to use uh, uh, atmospheric coordinates, which are different from Earth coordinates, like latitude and longitude. It uses uh, hour angle and declination. And so it is automatically in the hour angle declination mode when it goes on this, uh, my, uh, my construction. So this is my boss, John Jeffries. He, he gets all dressed up because he goes in to see uh, personages of the uh, uh, county government on the Big Island and other important people. And this is a eight inch uh, site survey telescope with excellent optics that uh, we would take images of the star doing a trail across a frame like this. And uh, by the way, I should point out um, on the previous, see, we, we don't have wood here. This is all uh, canvas. Well, the canvas blew down in the first big windstorm, even though we did a lot to keep it up. So uh, the, uh, what you're going to see in the way of uh, uh, plywood instrument shelters, it was the second stage. Now let's go forward. And anyway, this is a trail across from that eight inch telescope of a high magnification of a star image. I just uh, trailing down the frame. And if you can see that the uh, uh, it very, very little disturbances on this thing here. If, if uh, Anyway, we'll go on from here. Just take my word for it that this means excellent seeing. And here's another picture of this. This is another instrument we had, a double beam telescope, where this is about the size, well, about uh, two thirds of the size of a, of a substantial telescope mirror. We were going to have an 88 84 inch telescope, and this is about 60 inches. And this tells us what a beam of light, two beams of light that would be coming down to two different places on the big telescope would, would look like uh, with respect to each other. Well, this is another picture of the uh, uh, double beam telescope, and it has mirrors in here that reflect the two images to this camera, and the two images trace down the frame, and it looks like. Oh, I'll point out that this is the inside of the instrument shelters we built when the, uh, uh, the tarps didn't work. And here's another, uh, at night, he's uh, looking through the, uh, the camera that records the images. And this is what it looks like from the double beam telescope. This is from one beam and this is from the other. And the fact that they're separated by like five feet means that we're looking through a five feet separation of the atmosphere so this would be significant in terms of how these two images are uh, uh, are compared to each other. If the two images shown with the wiggles in phase, that means that it's vibration. Some car is driven past, or we dropped a, a box near the uh, the mount of the telescope or something, and we caused it to vibrate. But those there are no uh, coincidental vibrations. They all are seem to be uh, their own. Uh, uh, vibration uh, system. The uh, people that analyzed this, this is after analysis, the, this film went to Honolulu where a postdoc and a couple of other uh, uh, of, of the uh, uh, an analytic people uh, drew this to, sh to uh, help them reduce this data. And now we also took infrared record of the uh, of the atmosphere 
close, uh, the, the micro atmosphere, you might say, the atmosphere close to the ground, uh, up to 60 feet. This was at uh, seven and a half feet. You can't see it's off the frame. 15 feet, 30 feet, and 60 feet. And it's held up by these, uh, these lines here, cables. And it's pretty solid. But now you ha we had to uh, do maintenance on these. We placed these detectors. These are infrared detectors uh, to detect the temperature. And they're on uh, five foot uh, extensions because we didn't want to get the temperature of the mass to get it in the air. So to, to service this up here, you have to climb. There's a ladder on this. You climb past it. You've got a, a fully qualified uh, safety belt on. That uh, it's a professional safety belt. But here you have to unbuckle the safety belt to get past these cables. So you unbuckle the safety belt and you get past it, and then you buckle it again. But meanwhile, oh wow! And then you get up here, and now there is no support except for just the uh, the tension in the uh, the arms here. And this is the wind is blowing, and this is swaying back and forth here. And you've got to hold on with one hand, even though you've got a safety belt, and reach the other hand five feet out to pull off this uh, detector. And now I'll show you what it looks like if this is me up here. And this is what I see. And this is death down here. Uh, you, there's no possibility of surviving a fall down to this thing. And so we have to climb up here and do this from time to time. Again, there's no electricity here uh, from uh, 110 volts. We have a container down here somewhere. Here it is. And it has uh, battery operated uh, uh, chart recorders. And four of them, one for every one of these, these uh, detectors. And uh, chart recorders are driven by an automobile battery. So we would have to remember to keep that charged and replaced. And uh, so we don't lose data. Anyway, uh, going forward. Here is what it looks like from the side with somebody up there. And this is what our the final version of our shelter is, was. This shelter did not fail us in the strongest winds. It's, of course, there's no top to it. And uh, it held up. And it had to be disassembled at the end of the project. So this is nothing. This is a, a defect on a film. It is not uh, nothing in real life. And th th I think that extends to here, too. It made is a different color, so it made a different. So this, you see our instrument shelter from a new angle. And uh, this is uh, the summit uh, cinder cones uh, path that uh, you drive on. And they, they built the, it looks like this is on, on a slope, but it's not. This actually is just an open area of this same thing here. And this is where they built the 88 inch telescope right here. And this is, uh, I'm standing now at the main summit of the, uh, the geologic summit, and I'm taking a picture of our uh, what we call a summit station, which is across the uh, the center cone from the real summit. But there is a guy at the top of the uh, of that antenna. This is the 13 North site that they're going to build the uh, 30 meter telescope on. So you can see what the terrain is, and uh, we have our instrument shelter there, the weather box, and this is a uh, uh, four-wheel drive vehicle oh. and uh, you can see the uh, the main su uh, summit uh, set of cinder cones up here okay now let's see uh, building the observing there's just a few slides of this but it, it, this got blown down i wish i had a picture of how disappointed we were coming up here and seeing this all display all along over the uh, we didn't have the instrument yeah i think the instrument was still mounted but we uh, built a frame for it and had the uh, the footings in concrete, and uh, I de designed this this thing. I uh, I used to when I was in college. I worked with my stepfather on jobs. He was a carpenter. Here we have one. We've now making now mounting our uh, main instrument mounting uh, post here. It's a galvanized pipe. I think it's eight inches in diameter. Gal yeah, it's like a sewer pipe or something. I don't know what this is. I have no idea. But whatever it was, it had to be seated very well. And it's within the boundary of the uh, shelter. And this is what happens when you get a snowfall and uh, you've got an instrument shelter with no roof. It fills with snow. And there's no way to get that snow out of here except open the door. The door was in a place like this, only on the opposite side. 
And so we opened the door and then we had to shovel by shovel, full, carry it out and throw it out. And it took all day to uh, clean that out. But it, uh, our uh, instrument was protected, the toolkit. And here's another picture. That's our uh, the Quest Star mount, the A-frame. And that's the wind, uh, uh, the anemometer there. And the vehicle is here. And the door is on this side. Go in. And notice that it's bigger, longer this way than this way. This is east-west and this is north-south. And the stars moved from east to west. So we wanted to, to, uh, as, to have it being able to track the star in this direction. And it doesn't move at all in this direction, which is uh, the declination direction, just the hour angle direction. Anyway, that's what's uh, happened there. OK, let's look at Lake Wyam. Here we are, and because uh, we don't have an instrument site here, uh, a permanent one, because uh, nobody's going to build a telescope next to a body of water. But this is a uh, lake that's been up here for uh, uh, thousands of years. And there, there is a geologic reason why the bottom of this lake holds water, where that water isn't held on anything else. But I'm not going to uh, talk about it now. This is our Questar South, uh, Questar uh, Mount, and we took Questar readings of the sky and a weather box, and that's all we had. We did here at the, at the uh, for three weeks. Now I will say that. Uh, uh, oh, this is a uh, student help that was helping us. Anyway, uh, let me tell you about an incident I had with uh, my colleague here. Uh, he was uh, looking through the Questar at the sky, and this is uh, something like two o'clock in the morning, and it was dead calm, there's no wind at all. And I was taking measurements from this uh, weather box and both of us had our backs to the uh, lake when there was a big splash in the lake, splash. We looked at each other, we shined our flashlights in the lake and could see a, a ring expanding. There are no fish in that lake, fish can't possibly grow in that lake. There, how can, there's no wind, how can anything, we didn't hear anything go clunk, 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 splash. We just heard splash. Oh, we never figured out what it was. And so we never came back to this site that night. We went ahead on, on, on uh, future nights. We, we uh, observe, observed here on every run. But we were uh, kind of uh, a little bit uh, scared of it after that. And this is what it looks like in winter on the lake. Oh, I should show you uh, backspace. Uh, back here is where if the lake rises with a lot of rainfall, it will uh, overflow there, and that's Pohokaloa Gulch, and the gulch feeds down Mauna Kea to uh, the Pohokaloa training ground near the Saddle Road. Okay, here it is on uh, in wintertime, and it's frozen over. And there is a, a structure here of uh, there was a, a scientist that was doing research, getting a uh, information from the, the uh, lake bed. A, uh, a column of uh, dirt out of the lake bed. And this is me coming out here and walking on this ice, taking the chance of that ice cracking. And, uh, but uh, it didn't, although I wouldn't take such a chance today. Oh, I, they did uh, uh, experiments up here, the geologist back in the uh, days of uh, 30s and 40s where they had uh, a uh, uh, animal uh, to uh, carry them up here and carry the equipment. This is our equipment now that we were using, the uh, Questar mount and the uh, uh, weather box. This is Dr. Woodcock who is uh, doing uh, the uh, cores, measuring cores from the bottom of the lake with an assistant. And they're, they're doing everything on, on the ice. So, okay, life on the mountain, this is not much. Just to show you what we were putting up with here, uh, that uh, our job was to go all this way and up in here in the middle of the night to the blowing wind. Uh, there, nothing, uh, there's nothing can help us here. There's nothing, nothing to see, nothing to, we can't uh, telephone. There's no, nothing, uh, we were, what we did, we had a, uh, uh, a helper down at, in Hilo, an elderly retired guy that had a whole uh, uh, workstation of uh, equipment. 
and he could hear his uh, citizens band if we were located in certain points on the summit, on the eastern part of the summit. But anyway, this here was a van that we got from that South Point tracking station at the same time we got the trailer. And that we could stay in here between runs. And so we wouldn't have to go all the way back down to Hilo, I mean, back down to uh, uh, Halepohaku. Uh, we could just stay in here. And then, now I don't know why it was this low. This is about 11,000 feet. And uh, we may have had a site at 12,000 feet behind here. I don't know. Here we are. Uh, this is a fellow with his truck that uh, helps us from Hilo. And he drove up here with his truck for some purpose. I don't remember what it was, but he got stuck. And he called his wife on Citizens Band. And she called me and I drove uh, one of our vehicles up. I was uh, off duty down in Hilo. And this, they're taking our van up that we can rest in. You'll see pictures of the inside of this. And uh, we're emplacing it where we need it. We've moved it three or four times where, as, our, uh, uh, as our situation changed. And here it is now all set in place with uh, gas tanks because we have gas heater in there and gas lighting. And we come up here, open the door, and we go inside. And here we are. I'm inside there. There's the uh, 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 work workbench and a set of two uh, uh, of the uh, bunk beds. And then there was a third just over one side of the workbench. Anyway, this is my sister Rose. She and my mother came over to uh, visit us. At, uh, and they stayed in, in the house we were at. One of the uh, my colleagues that had one of the bedrooms graciously went and, and stayed with it for a week with a friend. And so anyway, Rose came up with me that night, and uh, uh, we got we had clothes for her, and we took her around, around. And here we are, and just resting again. And you can see the bed layout. Uh, we were generally not in here long, long enough to do any uh, any real sleeping. But uh, I'm not too, uh, too neat. I've got stuff scattered all around. But we were sitting here like this when all of a sudden there was a big scratching sound on this panel. We were just sitting here and all of a scratch. What is that? It couldn't be a dog because a dog would come barking up to the door. What dogs know about doors? And it, it couldn't be a human. What was scratch again? Whoa. So we got uh, up by the door, the door was locked and the wind was blowing hard and hard against the door. So we decided I'd shoulder the door open with a flashlight and I had uh, a uh, heavy hammer too. And my colleague had a big uh, uh, adjustable crescent wrench and cause we didn't know what to expect. Grrrach, here it is again. So I unlocked the door and threw my shoulder against it and looked out with a flashlight. And there it was, we crashed it, we did it again, scratch. And we saw what it was. It was a big section of paint peeling off the aluminum frame, not the frame, the aluminum uh, siding. Just look at what, what uh, a big wind does. They didn't paint this very well, I guess, because this, the paint's supposed to stay on in the wind. Uh, we're moving it to a different station. And here we're clearing the road. Uh, it it uh, never got this high again in future future winters. And he got stuck again. And, and uh, this is my colleague and I came up and helped him out. Oh yeah, I was training for the Tokyo Olympics here. I what, what no. That, these skis I found under the cabin down at Holly Pohaku. They'd been there probably for 20 years. And I just put my foot on them. These are old style that clamp on without uh, safety releases. So I just uh, stood on them and scooted sco downhill until they separated. And because they're not tied, tied on, I couldn't lift them off the snow. I, I just bailed. And we. Uh, Rented this bulldozer from uh, a neighbor in Hilo who uh, had the heavy equipment. And uh, so we did it ourselves and we were clearing snow there. And uh, now the epilogue. This was the 13 North site. And so you can now see what it looks like now. I came over in uh, uh, around 2001 because uh, people had complained, people being officials complained because. Uh, the site survey left some crap around, not only here, but at other sites. 
So uh, this uh, piece of, uh, of concrete here, but I don't really know what it is, it may be the footing to one of the um, big masts that uh, was that we had. Anyway, uh, we uh, we got our initials on this: James James Harwood, Dave Armstrong, Frank Che. He's our weather expert, and Joe Mueller from Switzerland. We left a little space for Joe Mueller. And then it says March something something, 1966. I'll bet that's still there. So now we'll do the, uh, again, we, remember I showed you this, this is what it was with no development at all. Then we had in 1970, the UH 2.2 meter telescope was uh, uh, dedicated. And this is the dedication. Uh, we had important people, that's uh, my boss, Dr. Jeffries, who became uh, uh, head uh, astronomer of the uh, University of Hawaii. And this is uh, Jeffries and uh, Governor Burns. And the astronomer that put that little 12 and a half inch telescope up on uh, Poliahu. And then Mauna Kea 1979, we've got some more observatories. This is Canada, France, Hawaii, uh, four meter telescope. I think it was at a three. Anyway, uh, this is a three meter infrared telescope. I did the, after I did this job, I got into uh, further into the technology, astronomy. And I uh, became the computer systems engineer for uh, telescope control and uh, the data acquisition of this observatory, the NASA uh, three meter, and this observatory, the UH-88 that we've been looking at. Okay, and that is the end. This is eight and 10 meter telescopes now, including Gemini, which is uh, where? Must be, can't see it here now. Let's see. Maybe it's that one. Anyway, so to the right from that one. Is it this one? Uh, to the right from it. To the right. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. That, that, of course, yes. Thank you. Yeah, because that's the 88 inch telescope. And that's uh, the uh, Gemini North. And the, anyway, so uh, this is what it looks like now. And that's the Harwood switchback. And there's the road along the top here. And it's what you all saw, so that's it. That's the end. Now you know how Mauna Kea formed, the astronomy system. I turn it back over to you folks. Sorry we ran a little over time. All right. Hey, we appreciate it. We can all put our videos back on so that um, mm -hmm. you can show a face to Jim. <laughs> and a little applause. That'll be appreciated. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, uh, appreciate. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate uh, sharing your viewpoints and thoughts. And uh, let's have an applause for Jim. Yay. Thank you kindly, folks. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Very, very informative. Thank you very much. Very good. Very thank good. Thank you, Jim. All thank right. you. Hey. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good, good night, night, everybody. And good night. Signing out. Aloha. <laughs>